airship and intergenerational action on um, air pollution. So, um, our session today, we're going to have a panel discussion. We're going to have some case studies of youth-led action on air pollution. Um, and we, there's going to be um, most likely a, an intermission in the middle for a, another speaker to come. Um, but we're going to roll with it and see what happens. But I'm just giving you a heads up. OK, so I'll introduce myself. I'm going to pass it to my co-organizer before we launch into this wonderful panel discussion. My name is Theo Gibbs. I am the design director at YLabs. Um, y Labs is a design and research organization that works in partnership with young people to address their priority health challenges, and um, including climate action and climate resilience and its effects on young people's health. Um, so air pollution is one of our focus uh, topics um, on our climate portfolio. Um, Alejandro, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Theo. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alejandro. I'm from Venezuela slash Colombia. And we're so happy to have you here and also have the Latin American perspective on why we need to fight air pollution. And here, wearing two hats, one from the Latin American Coalition for Clean Air, the first coalition to gather civil society, representatives of governments across Latin America to fight air pollution, and UNICEF, who is focused on why do we need to fight air pollution to make sure that we respect children's rights. So we're going to have a lovely conversation, and I pass it to our third organizer, Rob. Hi, everybody. Um, real pleasure to be here. My name is Rob Hughes. I'm a clinical research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm delighted to be here both as a researcher, um, as a doctor, but also as a parent. And our work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, we're delighted to collaborate with the World Health Organization as a collaborating center on planetary health and climate change. But we also increasingly think of ourselves as a youth collaborating center. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about our work with young people and about young people and children's health. So um, thanks very much for joining and look forward to the conversation. Okay, so before we launch into the panel, um, we're going to do a quick audience engagement activity so that we're not just talking at you the whole time. Um, all right, so I know it's loud, but I'm going to ask you to focus and join me if you're able. So I'd like you to, if you're comfortable, close your eyes for a moment. And we often take air and the act of breathing for granted. So right now, I just want you to take a deep breath in and out. Feel yourself alive, breathing in this moment, in this body. And with your, keeping your eyes closed, I invite you to bring to mind the last time where you really felt appreciation for the air that you were breathing, for clean, fresh air. Maybe it was a place outside. Maybe it was walking down the street. Maybe it was by the sea. Bring that place to mind, that moment, the details, and remember how you felt. Maybe it was gratitude. Maybe it was delight. Okay, and when you're ready, I want you to bring, come back to this space, open your eyes, and keep that feeling with you of the power and the joy and the pleasure and the necessity of clean air for our lives and for our planet. Um, so the goal of this session, as I mentioned, is to talk about what is the role of youth leadership um, to advance a multi-sectoral and intergenerational action on climate change. And we hope that you will walk away with some new ideas and some maybe creative tactics and connections to do this in your own work, in your own community. So to get us started, um, we're going to launch into a very distinguished group of panelists. Um, and I have some brief introductions. Um, there's, there's much I could say about each of you, but I will keep it brief, and then we'll launch in. Our panelists today are, um, I'll start well, it'll, it won't go exactly in order, but I'll start with Alejandro. So I know you introduced yourself, but Alejandro is a youth leader and a world economic global shaper. He's a founding member of the Latin America Coalition for Clean Air, which organizes youth-led activations um, of citizens, activists, and academics for clean air. Dr. Maria Nera is the director of Public Health, uh, Department of Public Health and Environment at the WHO. She is also appointed to the high-level advisory board of the Lancet for tracking progress on climate and uh, for health and climate change 
She is a champion on clean air um, and climate action. She has been awarded many accolades, which I will not list, but thank you so much for being here today and joining this conversation. Um, uh, and next we have Jane Bolton. She is a true mover and shaker. She's the founder and executive director of Clean Air Fund, which funds and partners with organizations across the world to promote air quality data, build demand for, public, for clean air, and drive policy action. And previous to starting the Clean Air Fund, she was the head of climate and energy science in the UK government. Thanks for being with us, Jane. Um, Rob Hughes, I know you introduced yourself, but just to say a bit more, um, Rob Hughes, LSHTM, where he got a portfolio of research on um, childhood development and climate change, and he previously worked at SIF and DFID, and has worked on health, nutrition, and climate uh, and child development programs in many countries around the world. Thanks. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Chin Chin Lam, who is a youth activist, advocate, and urban planner. She is part of the Yungo Cities Working Group and the Hong Kong Institute of Planners. She's also the founder of the social media platform Urban Acupuncture Hong Kong, and she is passionate about creating cities that are good for people and good for planet. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, all right, so we're gonna dive in. Um, so first I'll start with Alejandro. So Alejandro, we've seen a growing surge of uh, young activists advocating for climate action, um, but not so much on air pollution yet. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on what makes this issue your passion, and um, how do you think young people can help advance um, and drive the message on the link between clean air and climate action? Hello, everyone. Um, I think the correct way to start answering this question will be why everything started. I was born with asthma, and I'm also a forcibly displaced migrant from Venezuela. I had to leave the country. And asthma, as being a forcibly displaced migrant, reminds me of how things that you cannot control directly affect your, affect your future. Um, it's something that directly affects your health, your well-being. And when I moved to Bogota, I realized that I was suffering due to the air pollution in Bogota. Uh, over the last four years, I, I created something called the Right Not to Not Obey, that is a nonprofit that works to empower young people to fight air pollution, to use low cost sensors to monitor air pollution, and to do advocacy on public policy. And I want to give you two examples because actually, I think one of the main problems with air pollution is that people think that it's too technical for young people to be involved. And yesterday, I was in a panel, and I just stand up like, no, 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 no. Like, we need to allow and to, to, we need to tell young people people that they can fight their pollution. I mean, it is possible. Um, so I give you two things that we have done, and I think there are concrete ways that you can mobilize for, uh, for clean air. Uh, for example, now we're, we're working with different schools across Colombia, and when there is an air, an, an air pollution contingency, the schools, they raise a red flag that it, it connects with the color of the air pollution. So now everyone in the school, they know that there is an air pollution contingency and the kids know what are the effects and how they can mobilize. Or another example, following what the WHO has done, have you seen the WHO pavilion, the beautiful lungs? Uh, we install those lungs in different parts of Colombia. Uh, now with the National Citizen, uh, National Network of Young Leaders in Colombia run by the Ministry of the Environment, we have created over 100 lungs made with cotton on the streets. So people are aware of how air pollution contaminates the lungs. They start white, they end up black. I think what we want to say here is, it is personal. I couldn't breathe. For the first day I cop, I had to run, and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to make it. But, and then I have my inhaler. But what would happen if I didn't have it? How, fighting air pollution is just that, making sure that we're aware that we're doing it for the health of the people. Uh, what I want for future generations is that they don't suffer the same thing that we're suffering today. And they're able to live their life breathing cleaner. Thank you so much, Alejandro. I love that example of the lungs on the street visibilizing what's happening inside, outside. Um, next, I'll go to Dr. Maria Nera. Um, so Alejandro mentioned some of the, the challenges of engaging with the, the science and the data around air pollution. So I'm wondering, can you just break it down for us a little bit? How is air pollution um, affecting the health of children and young people? And what, in your view, can be done to address this issue? Let me, let me start by saying that I am a former, former um, youth delegate as well. So 
Uh, I, I prefer to still keep on that category. I like it. So I've been a former youth as well. And, and let me tell you one of the first things that happened in my career. I, I was trained as a physician on very good hospitals in Paris. I thought I knew how to treat plenty of things. And then I was very risky and I went with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières to a refugee camp. The first night where I was uh, covering for the whole health of the whole uh, refugee camp, and I, was, I thought I was relatively well prepared with all my uh, drugs and medicines and little knowledge and whatever. They still remember, I still remember with panic, they called me at three o'clock in the morning and they brought me a child, a four years old child who couldn't breathe with a horrible asthma attack. I mean, the, 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 the face of that child is still in my mind. I mean, <sighs> when you can breathe, it's horrible. And it takes a few seconds. You have only a few seconds to solve the problem because it's not something that you can sit back and say, okay, I'm a doctor, let me think, what do I do? No, you don't have time. It's so urgent, so desperate. The, 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 the child was touching me like this, saying, do something for me. I mean, I still have this sense of emergency somehow in my brain. And I think that if we cannot breathe, what else? I mean, if our politicians, if our cities are not creating the conditions for us to breathe air that are not killing us, I'm not talking about the, the pure air in the mountains of Switzerland. I'm just talking about air that will not kill us. What will be the next one? If we cannot breathe, what will be the next one? What, what will we deny to? You did a very nice exercise at the beginning. Can I propose another one that will take five seconds? Yeah. Guys, look at me. When I do this, you stop breathing, okay? Now. <laughs> you are already having difficult times, okay? <laughs> this is the, the feeling. This is the feeling of emergency. Even if you are climate activist, for you to know that you are already air pollution activist as well. Why? Because the causes of climate change overlap so much with the causes of air pollution. You will hear it later. But the combustion of fossil fuels are contributing to both climate change and air pollution. And air pollution is killing seven millions every year. Is that not a, a reason to be more mobilized going out, creating a big revolution? I mean, somebody will say WHO was calling for a revolution. Yes, I'm calling for a revolution, a health revolution. There is unacceptable that people is breathing air that is polluted. That's the minimum we can do for our health. So that's why WHO has these uh, standards on, on air quality. We would like you to convince your governments, your groups, your families, your friends, everyone, to endorse those, those uh, air quality uh, standards. If the governments uh, commit to endorse those standards, by default, they will be tackling the causes of, air, of climate change because they are the same. Accelerate this transition to clean, renewable sources of energy. Otherwise, we will stop breathing and it's certainly nothing that we want to see. Never, ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I just want to highlight what you said of, you know, what, all we want is to air that doesn't kill us. That's, a, you know, that's a pretty low baseline, but if we can just achieve that, that would be good. Um, so, um, to, oh, this mic is ripped. Um, you mentioned, you know, we need to get policymakers to adopt these guidelines and communities to push policymakers. So, Jane, I'm going to go to you. To you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jane, I'll go to you next. Um, what are some effective strategies you've seen to engage communities and particularly to engage young people um, to take action on air pollution and its links to climate? And how can those strategies be scaled? Thanks, Theo. Well, I was thinking about the question. Um, and I think there's probably three things that I would highlight. The first one is uh, making sure that the data and the science is youth focused. I know that you'll see some case studies later, so I won't steal their thunder, but of the citizens' clean air actions, where youth are collecting data about air pollution and the causes of air pollution. Um, there's also some really interesting reports that have been done by UNICEF, 
looking at where kids are most exposed. I don't know whether any of you could guess at what, what point in, the, in a normal school day would a, would a child be most exposed to pollution? Walking to school, exactly. UNICEF did a great report called the Toxic School Run. And uh, there's lots of other evidence that shows that their exposure is about five times more often on the way to school than uh, at any other time of the day. So having uh, kids measure that, like King's College London did, giving kids pollution monitors to stick in their backpacks so that they can see for themselves where their exposure is the greatest and maybe take a different route to school uh, is, is one thing. Second thing, I think, really, really good innovative communications. And youth are obviously really creative and have come up with some fantastic ideas. There's a great group based in London called Choked Up, and a group of teenagers that started hacking road signs. And they've created signs that look exactly like a government road sign, but it says, breathing here is dangerous for your health. Um, they've written on the road how many times that area has uh, exceeded pollution limits. And a group of teenagers in Delhi produced for the first time um, this poster that has now gone global, where they've created lungs, maybe like the ones that you've used in Colombia. They've created lungs out of um, filter paper that's usually used in air pollution monitors. And there's a vacuum behind. So over time, the pollution gets attached to the lungs and in uh, one city in Delhi, it only took two days for these lungs to go black. In London, it took two weeks, but it's still horrific. And then the third one, um, I think, is making sure that youth are, uh, always have access to uh, politicians and are, are being able to advocate for the solutions that they want to see. Um, we've worked with uh, eight-year-olds in the UK and in India teaching them about exposure to air pollution, but also asking them what kind of solutions do you want to see, and then giving them exposure to the mayor or the, um, the municipal authority so that they can present their demands. And one really great policy that's come out of things like that is school streets. If anyone has heard of that, school streets, where you basically close, or the families, the parents, the kids themselves, close off the street, and they can maybe put planters, they can paint on the road, and it creates a pedestrianized area around the school so that cars can't come. And when they're going to school and when they're playing outside, the pollution levels are lower. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, I just wanna note how what you're saying with these um, you know, youth-led projects also links back to what Alejandro was mentioning of you know, really the importance of young people's creativity and also visibilizing the impact in creative ways that people are gonna encounter. Great. Um, so Rob, I'll go to you next, and um, Jane mentioned a little bit about the importance of, of data and evidence. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how can research inform ev evidence-based policymaking and action at the city level to tackle air pollution and improve health? Thanks, thanks very much, Theo. Um, I'll follow Jane's pattern of, of three points, but I, I just want to start, I mean, I think it's, it's actually quite basic, but it's not always done. The first thing is we need to ask sensible questions. We need to ask the right questions. And that means not assuming that we as researchers always know the right questions to ask. It means working with young people as a constituency who can talk, who have a voice, and asking them and working with them to identify the questions. So for us, that means for our research, setting up a youth advisory group, which has got a diverse membership, and saying, these are some questions we're hearing, help us make them better. The second thing I would say is to answer those questions really well. And that means, again, being creative, being ambitious, um, and one of the ways we're trying to do that is to, to coming back to the questions, is to being very positive about the framing of, of, of the type of work we're doing. So, oh, it's great to hear some activism happening. <laughs> um, so for us, what that means is answer, what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to understand the lived experience of young people of high pollution. So right now, today, I don't know if any of you have seen, in Delhi, schools are closed, the uh, pollution level is at the hazardous level, uh, and there are children not going to school and suffering. What we're doing is we're using social media targeted recruitment adverts to capture the experiences of those young people today. And then what we're gonna do is compare that, how they're feeling, how they're sleeping, how much activity they're doing, what they're eating. Compare that to days when the air pollution is, is okay, not good, but a lot better. And so trying to be quite creative with our methods and then combining that with the, with the kind of rigorous methods. Um, 
I'd say the third thing is that there's no point producing research to go in journals that nobody really reads, or, or other academics are the only people who read. So we are very focused on doing research and getting it out there, producing videos, working with social media as a platform to share it, um, discussing research, not broadcasting it. Um, and then that means for policymakers, reaching them with clear, simple messages, as you said, messages. We want air that we can that is not going to kill us. It, it, it doesn't need to be so complicated. And I guess the, the sort of final point I want to make is that, to me, air pollution and the health of young people is a common currency. It's something that we can all talk about, we can all understand. You don't need any degrees or to have completed any schooling to know that the Alejandro's asthma attack or, or the, the case that, that Maria was treating or the, the children I treated when I worked in London, uh, that's not right. And then when we know that's preventable, that's, that's a, a story and a narrative we can use to drive change. And I think it's that common currency that can unite us. And then we all have a little piece to play in that. But let's unite around that health language. Because nobody cares about PM 2.5 and NOx levels. And I mean, the guidelines are very important. But they, but they, they, they don't resonate with us in the way that a child in front of us and the story or a premature baby, they, these, way, these things do. So that would be my kind of plea. Let's talk in a common language. Thanks, Rob. Thanks so much. Um, great. So, Chin Chin, I'll turn to you as a uh, final for this round. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about creative, creative research, Wait. creative advocacy. I'm wondering if you can speak from your perspective as a youth ad advocate, ad activist, uh, what is the value of youth leadership on this issue? And, and how can policymakers really establish mechanisms for young people to engage effectively and uh, respectfully? Thank you, Theo, for your question. Um, so what I find most valuable actually resonates with what um, uh, uh, Jane said about creativity and innovation that youth can bring. Um, because as society in general, we get used to things. We get comfortable with our daily lives. But the new generations, they grow up in a different environment. Things are changing, climate change, air pollution. We think differently. We have new ideas. And so I think Bringing those new views and bringing um, innovation can actively, um, and youth leadership can actively improve our environment. As an urban planner, I get to work with um, children and teenagers sometimes through public consultations or design workshops. And I love working with them because they're kind of crazy. <laughs> they, they just shout ideas at you without thinking about the practicality, the cost, feasibility. And that is great. That is exactly what we need for new innovations. Um, I'm 26 years old as a youth, and, um, and I think that my creative mind sometimes is limited already because of my experiences with rejection. Either the government doesn't want to pass things or clients doesn't want to pass things. So, but, but despite that, youth um, from Citizens for Clean Air, Alejandro, um, I, I do some pedestrianization projects as well in Hong Kong. We still manage to um, voice out and we still manage to find channels to do these uh, meaningful projects for the air quality. And um, I want to say that, that that in itself gives its own value, but it won't be sustainable if you don't fully understand and reflect the needs of, of youth. So like Rob said, you really need to understand what needs to be found out and not decide on a topic and then research and help on it. And, and so like, and what can policymakers do? So exactly like this children and youth pavilion, policymakers can create clusters for, and platforms to nurture youth talents, um, incubate innovation, ideas, let youth share ideas. Every day I come here, I want to find a space outside to discuss with my team. I can't find a space. I don't know your experiences, but I think it's great as well. Uh, how many ideas have we came up with? How many interventions we've made? So, Obviously, we need spaces like this, and they are important, but similarly, they can be done at a local and city level as well. So policy makers and decision makers, we need a space like this. And in terms of particip participation, um, baseline, we need, um, we need to welcome, to create an intergenerational platform for children and youth to voice their concerns. Uh, it could be through public consultations, design workshops, or, or games. Um, or street voting. And, but I think most importantly is to have 
youth uh, directly at the decision-making tables, uh, not only to actively participate, but to also directly shape our own environment that we will be living in for a long time. Um, having meaningful youth engagement and, and leadership will allow better policy making and development, uh, develop projects that can better reflect the real needs of youth, children, and our vision for the future. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Chen Chen. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just want to echo what you ended on of having young people at the decision-making table and welcoming young people's ideas and fresh perspectives on how we can tackle. So I've not seen an interruption to our session yet, which is good, but if any of the organizers need to interrupt us, then please go ahead. Um, so until I get interrupted, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to do a, a sort of rapid fire on the panel. Um, so, Chin Chin, I'll start with you, so we'll go in reverse order. Um, you ended on a really kind of call to action note, and I just want to say is, or ask, um, if you could have, uh, give one key takeaway to our audience and decision makers about um, youth leadership and clean air and climate action, uh, what else would you add as a quick takeaway? I think, like, like I said, you will be rejected. You will be, but don't give up on that. Keep going and lo look at Alejandro. They did projects, Clean Air, uh, Citizens for Clean Air. It, just keep fighting, keep engaging with your local councillors or, or government, um, and decision makers, policy makers, listen to youth. Give us a platform, give us a chance. We have the capability to shape our future. I, I think that would be my key takeaway. Just I keep love trying. It. <laughs> awesome. Rob, I'll pass to you. Thanks very much. Look, I think my, my kind of core takeaway message would be if you see questions and issues being discussed that matter to you and you are not involved in that conversation, like take the space, take the mic, interrupt, make your, you know, you need to make some noise. Um, and if people are not listening to you, you're probably not reaching the right people and they're not answering, they're, they may be not the people you need to be reaching anyway. So I think health can be an entry point and use that as a way to get into those conversations, those political processes. And then help continue to build the community as you're doing. I think it's, yeah, it gives me some hope. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, I think tell your story. Uh, one of the things that's lacking uh, on this topic is stories like Alejandro's and Maria's about how their own experience of people suffering or, or themselves suffering from air pollution. And we need more of that because that's memorable. The data is great and it's necessary for policy making and it does convince policy makers but stories convince the general public so tell your story can I be a little bit provocative please you know after all I'm with the youth so I'm sure that you, you are not on social media you will not uh, do anything about you will not quote me but honestly we are gaining more and more yeah I saw you we are gaining more and more evidence on how air pollution is affecting our brain, correct? Okay. My theory, the provocative one, is that maybe because air pollution is affecting the cognitive development, maybe, and I say maybe, our intellectual capacity is going down, and that's why we are not taking enough action on fighting climate change. So please be intelligent, be smart, don't allow air pollution to make your brain functioning at the lowest level. Come on, thank you. And use your vote. Well, for those of you who are more than 18 years old, use your vote rightly. That will have an incredible impact. And don't be impressed by what you see here. You can change it. You don't need to replicate the model you see. You don't need to be like us. You need to be much better more influential, more provocative, more creative. So don't copy us, be much better than us. <laughs> My takeaway would be, if we finish this session and you go out of here saying that clean air is your human right, we did our job. What we want is to make sure that when you're organizing, where you're advocating for climate action, please advocate for your right with Thank you so much.
Um, wonderful. Well, I know that uh, you know we have a lot to digest and inspiration to digest from that panel. Um, what we're going to do now is switch to a uh, inspiring case study to give you some more ideas about how action and youth-led action um, looks like for clean air. Um, so I'm going to bring up Toby and Collins. You're here. Um, and thank you. Well, before we do that, sorry about that. Let me just give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, may, I may I say one yeah. small thing? Um, I'm, I'm really worried about young people thinking that they don't have the tools to fight air pollution. So one thing that I will give you, because there's a lot of things, uh, we did a toolkit with UNICEF called Let's Talk Air Pollution. Literally, that's like our base guideline. And with the two case studies that we're going to see, I really want you to feel, because you can make the difference in air pollution. It's not too technical. It's not just for the experts. It's not for the government. It's for you. Like, I really want to see more uh, young advocates fighting air pollution. I think we're like three at COP. That cannot be. We need more people here really seeing that air pollution is your right as young people. It's not just loss and damage. It's not just mitigation. It's your right to not die because you're breathing. Thanks, Alejandra. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I'm going to invite you to off, off the stage, the podium. Um, and Collins and Alejandro? There you go. Uh, uh, Collins and um, Toby? Okay. Oh, they just left the slides. Okay, everyone. We're going we're gonna to round out this session with an inspiring case study from two young leaders um, working for clean air in their cities. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to pass the, pass the mics over to Toby and Collins to introduce the case study, to introduce themselves. Um, and I hope that this will be an inspiring example for you to take back to your um, communities and your work. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Toby Loba Ajayi. My name is Oluwa Toby Loba Ajayi, and I work for Center for 21st Century Issues. Today, I'm representing Lagos State, Team Lagos State, under the Urban Better Science Project Citizens for Clean Air. And I will be presenting the project, the Citizens for Clean Air project in Lagos State. So, what's the Citizens for Clean Air campaign? It's a youth driven citizen science campaign that produces open source data for, to advocate for clean air and early spaces in African cities. So, the African cities that this project was implemented in uh, Lagos State, Accra, and, 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 and South Africa. So first, our principles are, is, that, is, is, is to ensure that we are African-led, and also it's global equity-centered and youth-driven. So how did this campaign work? So firstly, we, in Lagos State, we had 10 run leaders, and these 10 run leaders were able to, rec uh, with the, the, they represented diverse sets of neighborhoods in Lagos State. And also, each, each of these run leaders designed a 5 to 15 kilometer run in their, in, in their routes in different neighborhoods, using, make, making sure to assess localized air quality and receive training. And prior to that, we received training in data collection, and also were also trained on advocacy tactics. Also, each run leaders recruited local members who had interest in, this, in, in, in air pollution and clean air, and uh, they, they joined the run leaders to run to collect air quality data to assess, assess public space quality. And lastly, we targeted local government engagements and widespread. We did uh, a social media visibility on citizens for clean hair. Thank you very much. So I'll be passing this on to my colleague, Collins. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm Collins Gamali Hodoli. I represent um, Clean Air One Atmosphere, but on these occasion, I'm with Urban Butter, 
I'm also a lecturer in one of the local universities in Ghana, University of Environment and Sustainable Development. Uh, we want to set the base for this. If you look at what is on the board, we want to have a look at access to data. But a key thing we need to consider is that in 2019 alone, yeah, 1.1 million folks die in Africa prematurely due to air pollution. And then more than half percent of these are children. And these was due to household air pollution. Another key thing to consider is that 200 and 36,000 folks dying from these were children under five. And 40% of these were children who could not be able to attain the age of five. Now, the message to you is that what are you going to do about these statistics? With you, we have the tools. I know folks are saying that there is no data. There is nothing to actually work with. But we have the data. We have been using local census to democratize air quality monitoring in Ghana and wider Africa. So what we have done, which Toby said earlier, is this run thing to actually engage everyone. That's one key aspect. Then the other key aspect is to be able to meaningfully and openly communicate this data so people like you can take action. People like us can take action. You know, the key thing is if you don't know what you are breathing, you wouldn't be able to protect yourself. So data is key, but that data should be communicated openly and in a free manner. Another key thing is that we want to be able to engage ourselves, communities, local societies, organizations, to be part of the decision making. You know, you have the ideas, you are very creative, very innovative, you have the solutions. Bring them on the board. For instance, if you look at Ghana, why is the Ghana EPA not publicly communicating air quality data? The infrastructure is there, but so why are they not taking advantage of it? You can do something about it. Air is not like food where you go to a restaurant and select what you want to eat. We are breathing what is in this space. What is here is what everyone is breathing. So if it is poison, we are all breathing that. So we are part of the solution because we are part of the problem. Now, the other key thing is that to live in a city that helps, but there's no harm. How do we ensure that that is done? With knowledge. And that knowledge is at the fingertips of everyone, which is why we want to use these tools that are able to communicate data remotely, and then you can access these over the cloud wherever you are in the globe. We have a mobile application which communicates data openly, and what we are even used for the run, you can access that data wherever you are. Can you shift to the next? So what we have achieved so far is that we have mobilized over 400 citizen runners on clean air runs across Africa. That is Lagos, Accra, and Cape Town. And then we collected data locally, so it's not just about air quality, but then we want to look at building you know, communities and environments that are habitable for us. We also created an open source interactive platform uh, that will be shown if the internet allows us. Then the next thing is that we have been able to engage, and we are still engaging local government. It is important to engage politicians, but that should not be a sustainable or that cannot be a sustainable solution because there's going to be a change of regimes. And then if there's a change of a regime, it means that the politician you had engaged before is no more there. So who is going to implement those changes? Which means that we would have to resource and engage and empower the youth because we are the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, so how can you get involved? We actually have in... Um, a very informal run on, on the 11th of November, so you can join us uh, from this uh, resort. What's the, what's the uh, Ferus? So you can join us. We want to be able to do a 7 a.m. run, uh, about 5 to 8 kilometers. And so we're going to be populating this data, and it's going to be on the open source so everyone can access. Thank you very much for the opportunity. The chance is yours. Let's take our action for clean air. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, and I'll also mention there's a QR code up here for the project if you want to check out um, the work that's been done to date, the open source data and the data platform. Um, so you can take a photo and scan it um, and access that right now. Let's just go off. Yep. Um, and there's also going to be a social media activation tomorrow for this project. Um, so thank you, thank you so much to both of you. Um, so we're coming to the close of this session. Um, and we've, we've heard from a lot of different perspectives and leaders, um, youth leaders um, from 
at, on clean air and climate action. So I want to take a moment with the audience, with the folks right here, and I'd like you to just take a moment and reflect. What is something, what is something that, you, that sparked you, that grabbed you from this conversation, um, that maybe inspired you, that you want to take forward in your work? So I want to give you a second to think about that. It might be a new insight, it might be a new idea, it might be something cool about the data. And I want you to find someone next to you, maybe someone you don't know, and, and share that, okay? So just take, one, take about one minute each to share um, something that, that you're taking away from this conversation that you want to apply to your work. Okay, and then if you uh, go ahead and switch to the next person, if you haven't shared already. Now I'm going to I want to hear from a couple people just very quickly. All right, I'm going to start with Jeffrey. Do you want to share one one takeaway or one thing you're learning? Sure. Hi everyone. Um Hello. Hi. So I'm Jeffrey Mboya. I am uh, the youth advisor and uh co-chair of London, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropic. <laughs> I am Geoffrey Mboya, a youth advisor for We Don't Have Time. I also co-chair youth advisory board with the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we do have a project uh, which we also partner with Y Labs, uh, Children's Cities and Climate Change. And uh, air pollution is one of uh, the subject that we are really interested in in 16 cities across uh, the world, uh, and I'm from Nairobi. So my take today, uh, just from listening to the panel, is uh, the idea of uh, young people organizing their communities and not just uh, talking, not just advocating, but uh, using data. Um, I am from Nairobi where we lead, uh, we have young uh, researchers who are collecting data in uh, in urban poor communities like Mukuru, Madare, Kibera, where um, we did, uh, we recently did uh, a workshop with Y Labs, where we also had co-designing sessions, which were really interesting because we could really hear directly from young people who are living uh, in uh, neighborhoods where we have poor uh, west uh, west manage west management uh, systems and uh, they're directly being affected. So uh, one, one, one of the things that I really uh, think should be done is just you uh, having that platform to uh, air out these issues and also uh, provide data, uh, which is useful when you're approaching policy makers, we're approaching organizations that are really interested in investing in uh, air pollution with uh, young people. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jeffrey. All right, I want to hear from one more person. What's the takeaway? Thank you. I'm not sure if I should stand up or not, but my main takeaway is that we cannot separate youth activists who are involved in climate change and raising awareness with climate change and youth activists who are working on problems. For example, in Serbia, we created a youth declaration on clean air, uh, which will be soon released. Uh, I invite you to maybe Check it out. It's also created in collaboration and support with UNICEF. Uh, so that would be maybe a main takeaway for me. Okay, is there one more person who wants to share? Yeah. Hello, my name is Amara Unelli, and I'm the founder of Fight Nigeria from Lagos, Nigeria. Sorry, there's feedback. But, um. Hello. Oh. Hello, my name is Amara Unelli, and I'm the founder of Fight Global Warming Nigeria. One thing I took away is that clean air is a right, and we have a right to advocate for that. And we should go around a community spreading the knowledge and just use what we have and the resources wherever we can find it to not only help ourselves and our community, but better the fight for climate change. And that we cannot rest until this happens. And the future generation, um, depends on us and depends on everyone here so that we just have to fight for what we want. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, that's coming to the end of our session. So I want to, to wrap this up. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna say clean air three times and make it as loud so that everybody in this pavilion, everyone in this building can hear it, okay? Ready? So on three, we're going to say, I'll, I'll call out clean air, and then you're going to respond. All right? We're going to bring a little bit of activist jazz to this. What? We're just, I'm going to say clean air. You're going to say clean air. OK, ready? All right. Well, actually, I'm going to say, what do you want? You're going to say clean air. OK, ready? That makes more sense. All right. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you made some friends. Come talk to us afterwards if you want to want some more fun ideas.